Hello and welcome to First Friday Live. I'm Dr. Perry and I hope this is broadcasting. It looks as though it is and uh, we are really excited today. I'm going to be talking today about the uh, using oral medication and insemination. Why? Not everyone needs IVF to get pregnant when getting fertility therapy. And so we're going to be talking about a lot of the factors into who is a good fit for lower cost, lower tech ways of getting pregnant and how to be more economical about it. We're going to talk about what are the causes, how that influences the duration of infertility, um, again, cost, assertiveness, the amount of time people have with which to conceive. There are all kinds of variables that, um, that go into such a decision. However, and we're even going to talk about what insemination is and what it means and all kinds of things like that. However, before that, I actually have a very exciting and one of the coolest things I get to do is to introduce um, another team member. Uh, Sarah Slayton um, is a phenomenal uh, team member and she is the nurse practitioner uh, that spearheads our Shreveport office. Again, we've signed the contract for where we're building in Shreveport, so even though we've had a satellite once a month there, we are soon going to be out there all the time. Um, hey Jackie, hey Andrew, um, let me just roll this over a little bit so Sarah can say a quick hi for things. Hi right? everybody. Yeah, tell us about yourself or Sarah. So. I don't know if I've met most of you, but those who I have, hey again. Um, I actually live in West Monroe, but I'm planning to move to Shreveport very soon. I've uh, worked in women's health at Oshner LSU in Monroe, and very excited to um, begin this fertility journey here with Dr. Perry. We love Sarah, and she's going to be phenomenal for all this, and so we are just really, really excited. Okay, I've got to get myself on the screen a bit, or I'll just rotate this back. I am not going to start her out by putting her completely on the spot, having her do the entire talk today uh, for things, but um, we're going to um, uh, be doing a lot to sort of um, get her involved and engaged and we're really excited she will be uh, helping us out uh, for, the, for Shreveport so people can get more daily care out that way. Okay, let's talk about sort of a broader discussion for fertility and for who needs oral medication and insemination. Now, before you get into anything in too much detail, you still have to make sure you have the right diagnosis for people. And so the thing is, you don't want to be doing inseminations, for example, for therapy for someone where the tubes are blocked or they're in ovarian failure or the uterus is rife with polyps or fibroids and where things would never attach. So I do think that understanding the body is critical before you make a decision as to what approach is right for you. And actually for October, our next uh, First Friday Live, we're going to be scope, focusing on the periscope test and talking about what we do that's sort of a unique or um, approach that we patented, we pioneered, all kinds of things that we've done. And we want to talk about how you can understand your fertility better. However, to step it back from that, let's talk about fertility as a whole. Fertility, you're saying, what are your chances in a given month and what can you do about it? And so the first thing is when people are doing natural and they're just trying to get pregnant the old fashioned way, most people we see are running about a 1% chance per month of spontaneous pregnancy leading to a live birth. And most people don't even realize that it's that bad. Um, and actually, I've got a lot of people who are even the 0 0.5 and 0 0.1 and things like that. And it's pretty rare for me to see someone really doing more than 2 to 3% a month. I sometimes still see 4%. Um, percent. But the thing is, that still means there's a 96% chance for most and a usually 99% that a particular month won't be the one in which one gets pregnant. And people don't realize their odds and they just keep plugging along the old fashioned way, having relations and crossing their fingers. And occasionally it plays out, but for 99%, it won't that month. And so we want to see what we can do to sort of rev up fertility. And most of the therapies for fertility, because again, I often say it's, fertility isn't easy, but it's simple. It boils down to the guy having sperm, the woman having eggs, they're meeting in the tubes and having a place to go in the uterus. So most of fertility comes down to fixing or improving one of those things. So you do 
insemination to rev up the sperm. You give oral medication to improve the eggs. Um, you see if the tubes are open and repair is complicated. Check out the February 2020 First Friday Live for a lot of discussion on the tubes. And I'm blanking on which one was the uterus, but also you want to make sure that the uterus is hospitable and will help sustain a pregnancy. Now, for the eggs, obviously you rev that up through oral medication usually. Uh, and this is Clomid, this is Letrozole. We prefer to use Letrozole relative to Clomid. I think uh, Clomid turns everyone into the devil um, from all the hot flashes and the misery that can come with it. Not everyone, but a lot of people. And it can thin the lining. And so we find that as long as you are getting a reasonable response, it's not so much just which medication you use, but how much of a response where you guide how much the ovaries are revved up and how many eggs you get that determines not only the success, but also um, the safety and ultimately that's the true goal of the medication. Everyone, there are all kinds of voodoo out there where people are saying, oh, take ginger or Siberian ginseng or pineapple core or all that stuff. But really what anything you ingest does to affect your fertility, most there, I can think of very little for, for even prescribed medications that can refine the uterus. And none of them will open up the tubes. A woman taking a pill won't improve the sperm. And so most of what people ingest to improve their fertility ultimately relates to egg regulation, whether you get more. And again, pineapple core and Siberian ginseng and all those things don't increase the number of eggs. In fact, a lot of things with phytoestrogens actually can block egg release, which is a whole other story in and of itself. And so there's a difference also between super ovulation and ovulation induction. Ovulation induction is going from zero egg to one. Super ovulation is going from one egg to two or three or more. And so, but the other way of improving things beyond getting extra eggs is insemination, where again, you are taking the sperm from the guy. He's collecting at home or producing a sample at the office. We have professional collection rooms. Um, we don't throw you into a bathroom or a closet, which a lot of places have, which made, I feel for the guys who've gone through those miserable experiences. But um, we try to have facilities. And then you take the sperm, you wash it, you purify it, you put it directly in the reproductive tract. It's a lot of a setup like a pap smear. Um, and when you do that, it's the equivalent of 20 to 50 acts of intercourse for how many sperm find an egg. And so this starts getting into the efficacy of insemination. If the reason you weren't getting pregnant was there weren't many sperm, they were having trouble finding an egg, and then you rev it up so that that occurs, that really increases the chances. One of the interesting things for insemination for how much it improves fertility is that the people who have the lowest counts often often get the most benefit from insemination. So as you sort of stratify what a person's individual chances are, the guy who had 1 million total nodal sperm, and remember, for how we look at the sperm, normal is 60 to 80 million, so for, and it, but it takes 10 million in an act of intercourse for one to find an egg. So if a guy is running 10, 1 million total nodal sperm, it means roughly once a year, one sperm will find an egg. But if you do insemination, where all of a sudden it's a 50-fold increase, that means five sperm found the egg that month, all of a sudden that has an enormous impact relative to the guy where 200 million total modal sperm, so 20 sperm found an egg in a given month and you took it up to 1,000, sperm were fill, still finding the egg. You still get benefit for the guys with high counts, but you don't have quite as much benefit as where you created opportunity where it was limited before. So this is particularly valuable for guys with low counts, but most people benefit. In fact, that's sort of getting into the roots of things. Who should get insemination? Again, beyond the people where their tubes are blocked and things won't attach, you've got to often have to bypass the tubes. The people can try to power through it. I think we oversimplify the tubes as fully open or fully closed when in fact it, there can be some shades of gray um, as to where it, um, they lie and it's an in-between where it can be partially open. But that's also associated with ectopic pregnancies and other things. That's a whole nother story. Again, we'll talk about that more at another time. But the, so if you're saying it's a sperm issue, the more the sperm issue, the more insemination benefits by giving sperm and egg an opportunity to find each other. 
if you're saying that it is other issues, if a person is in a laboratory, um, I had some notes actually here and that just dropped for a second. There we go, putting that back up. Uh, of course, I'm going complete freestyle and ignoring the notes anyway, and you'll see I tend to do that a lot for these talks. But if you say that uh, it's a pure egg issue, a person is anovulatory, this is a Kate Gosselin, where you're supposed to go from zero egg to one, insemination doesn't help that much. But if you're saying that a person is oligoovulatory, this is one of the interesting things. People just say, oh, you have PCOS, that's why you're subfertile. Well, if a person never releases an egg, just making it so that they release an egg makes an enormous difference. But the woman who has 35 day cycles, or let's say it's 40 day cycles, where she has nine cycles in a given year instead of 12, often there's a superimposed unexplained infertility in these cases, and the women act much more like unexplained infertility than anovulatory or the, what people classically allude to as PCOS because ultimately roughly 75-80% of women get pregnant in three months. We often say that if you know if you've been trying to conceive for three years you should have been pregnant 12 times in that time. It's not exactly that but you know you say it should have certainly happened a lot. The woman who has had 40-day cycles instead of 30-day cycles if instead of 12 times, she should have been pregnant nine times over that, there's still something going on that's very different from the person who just never released an egg in that point. The never released an egg, you can rely simply on generating eggs. But people where there's a superimposed unexplained infertility, you're often wanting to make it so that you're not just treating the irregular cycles, but also trying to wrap things up with insemination. So I would say you use it for male factor, you use it for, you know, unexplained infertility, you use it for oligoovulatory infertility more than anovulatory, but there's some flexibility for revving things up. That gets into economics, that's a whole other story I'll come to later. We then are also thinking about other things. Endometriosis, again, while treating endometriosis is important, a lot of people actually get surgery for it where the cost of the surgery, if you spend, many people say that if you have stage one to stage two endometriosis, you often need 40 surgeries for one additional pregnancy, in part because some people, when you go for the laparoscopy, end up not having endometriosis. And so this is for debate. But ballpark, if it's a $10,000 surgery and you spend $2,000 for your deductible for the chance of the one in 40 bonus pregnancies, you could have done a lot of oral medication and insemination to bring out about babies more economically than necessarily that laparoscopic surgery. So that's one of the considerations. So you look at it for endometriosis. Again, you can try to overwhelm tubal factor, but remember tubal factor has association with ectopic pregnancy. For recurrent miscarriage, there's some debate for that. I think some people will use it to where you get more Potential embryos, more likely that there's a healthy one in the mix. But other one, people would say, if you're getting pregnant instantly, it's not subfertility, it's a sustaining the pregnancy. And so some would lean away from that. And that's more for another discussion that's focused on recurrent pregnancy loss uh, later on. The, uh, so there are a lot of things that can be going on for people. And again, uterine factor, obviously, if you have polyps, if you have ashermans, if you have fibroids, if you have things disrupting the site for implantation, you want to normalize that um, before trying to conceive um, and before you start getting into inseminations for things. So you want to look at cause. Another thing, as we talk, so who would benefit? We've talked a bit about this. And again, generally, as you look to numbers, if you say a person's 1% a month, we often see for people with a shorter duration of fertility, every month of insemination and oral medication is the equivalent of six months of trying naturally. As you get to longer, you might even argue that it's for a full year of trying or even more, uh, depending on the factors and you can tweak the odds. But often we see 15, 20% per month, and we can even see as much as 40% of people being pregnant over three rounds of oral medication and insemination. Again, 
you don't think, if that's 15% a month, there's an 85% chance per month that it doesn't work, and that's a normal statistic. And especially if you have tubal blockage, that might be 90% or 95%, depending on the scale of things. There are all kinds of things that go into that. But you can say, what is the alternative? And if, the, if you are spending roughly 500 a month for oral medication and insemination, that's roughly where we are. Again, a lot of the U.S. is 1,000, 1,500. They're charging you way more. You have to look at the economics for the yield relative to going on to IVF. But if you're saying IVF is 18,000 or 25 or 40,000, where I've seen it in some places, you know, if you can get a 40% chance of being pregnant for roughly 1,500 bucks, many people will try that before they're going 55, 60, 70 for 18,000. And so it depends on what is driving things and what your anticipated yield is. Many people also are not very assertive in how they approach oral medication and insemination. They just say, here's a pill, here's one pill of letrozole. They don't even monitor and see what the yield is. And if you just take a pill, and again, if you're just taking one pill of clomid or letrozole for an ovulatory person, the majority in some studies actually have just still gotten one egg. There is no benefit to taking a pill to generate more eggs and you still got one egg. And that's why you see often that in some places people tend to have a lower yield for oral medication and insemination. We often see around 15% for people with open tubes and a reasonable prognosis. But for people where the tubes are blocked or again, if you're just doing one egg, you can often see in the 8% range or half of that. And so you want to make sure that you've rev things up appropriately based on the prognosis. Um, but yeah, a lot of places charge twice to three times as much as what we do, and they get half the pregnancy rate. And if you are getting one-sixth the yield, that tilts the you know dollar spent per pregnancy achieved, that tilts the balance as to what you should lean towards, but I think there are ways of doing oral medication and insemination economically. By the way, any core questions that I should be answering um, for things? Um, all kinds of good people here. Uh, I, hi for everyone when we do this live. Um, and again, this will be recorded and then again, it'll be available to people later on. Check out our archives for all these things. But I do enjoy seeing all the familiar faces as we go about this. In terms of what we end up uh, doing for um, looking at sort of what the chances are, another thing that we have to talk about is duration of subfertility. Now, if you've been trying for a year and we see that you have, you've dropped 12 eggs over the course of a year. And we do oral medication insemination, and we're bringing you up to three eggs. So not only are we revving up the sperm, but also we've got a 25% boost in the number of eggs available for which sperm and egg to find each other. You know, going from 12% to, um, 20, yeah, to 15 eggs, that goes a long way for things. Um, and so, um, and I'm just pointing out something. Things. If you go that, however, the person who's been trying for 10 years and has released 120 eggs, and you go from 120 eggs dropped over time to 123, there's diminishing returns. And we start to see there's just so many opportunities for sperm and egg to find each other that you start saying, hey, you know what, we just have to bypass the tubes and make sure they did find each other. So that's a very important consideration. The duration and the longer you've gone with just trying to conceive the old-fashioned way, the less benefit we can see with oral medication insemination. In fact, this is something that's very important and personal that we have to look at. When you come in for our office, we're giving you a personal assessment for saying what are your individual chances in a month for natural conception, what are they with um, oral medication insemination and what are they with just oral medication and what are they with IVF and you want to know what your return is based on your inherent prognosis so this does need to be individualized remember everything I'm saying this is all general advice and you should see a doctor to say how much does this apply to you and we'd love to give you that direct counseling but the longer you go, the lower the yield from oral medication and insemination. And some people, again, that makes more sense to go into IVF. But for others, for instance, let's hit take diminished ovarian reserve. 
if much of the power of the IVF is in getting 15 or 20 or 25 eggs, which will give you, you know, four to six blastuses, high quality embryos, heads you're pregnant, tails you're not. If you have four to six tosses of a coin, that makes a lot of sense for one at least coming up heads. But if you have diminished ovarian reserve and you only have five eggs, I had a person with that earlier today, her going on to IVF makes less sense than the person with 25 eggs because that really only gives her one toss of that coin relative to five or six. And so these are people, when you say that the cost of I, if you look at oral medication versus insemination, and I'm sorry, I, you guys know me, I do the numbers, I like making things tangible for things. If you are doing the numbers and you say for, for having one egg, um, IVF has a four times higher chance of bringing home a baby than from oral medication insemination. If you, IVF is 30 times the cost of insemination, roughly. If you're getting four eggs, and that's the max you could get, why not stick with insemination relative to if you can get 25 eggs, you start getting more you. So it has important implications for a person with diminished ovarian reserve that they stick more with the oral medication and insemination. Um, um, the, um, so I've got a comment here, by the way, for saying, okay, um, um, you know, that a person is just mindful on the money is more important. I, first of all, for someone who's saying that, you know, they did IUI and then had a miscarriage and then things didn't work, First of all, I feel for you, and I am so sorry you felt that way, and I never want anyone to feel that they're not loved or they're part of the family and things are there. The problem, you know, as you have one pregnancy not go forward, we often are wanting to do things for um, testing to better understand them, and I think there are a lot of ways of approaching it. I think that's something that has to be individualized. When I tend to lean to IVF, relative to oral medication and insemination. It relates to the person's individual prognosis and something is going on for them individually. Again, without coming in, commenting on individuals, but I would say I am always open to whatever's right for you. I'll do three rounds, six rounds, nine, 12 rounds, whatever is right for you. And I think that's something that warrants communication for where that balance is. And the thing is, if we try to go in a particular direction, it often relates to that person's individual chances and that we're just trying and hoping for that person because of what we've seen rather than, because, but here's the thing. If you say something is right for you, I'm a big believer in informed autonomy. You tell us what is right for you and we want to support you in it. We just also don't want you to be disappointed or an exercise in futility. That is very important for things. I think you're right though, cost really matters. IVF is a lot more expensive than inseminations. And so that's why a lot of times I do lean towards inseminations. And you look at much of the US, they'll often do only one or two inseminations before going on to IVF. Well, we will often not only do three, but even four, five, six, or even more, depending on the chances. It really, though, has to be individualized to what the variables are going on for the other person. Um, the other thing that we that can change us and can push us more to IVF also relates to the time left. Some people have less time than others, and they have diminishing ovarian reserve. They're running out of eggs, and it's speak now or forever hold their peace. And again, if you have 30 eggs and you're young, that often gives us a lot more time relative to the person where I saw a person that was doing a, earlier this week, she'd been doing a lot of works in, uh, workups in reproductive immunology and had very little to show for it. She was 40, had spent a year try, elsewhere doing a workup for things, and she had lost 30% of her fertility in that year, and uh, but had nothing to 
show for it. There's some debate as to whether there's natural killer cells affecting things, but there was no treatment that had been identified. And so she lost 30% of her fertility over a period of time without any intervention that would make a difference. And so when you see that type of thing going on, you feel for people and you don't want people investing time and energy that result in a lost opportunity where they've lowered their chances without having offset or improved things. You want understanding, you want good diagnoses um, as much as possible, but also if you're going to invest money in additional testing that doesn't change your chances, you don't want to have people waste their time and their money on something where they don't have something to show for it. A lot of good people um, on here for things. Um, love to see all these faces and things like that. Um, and please um, give me um, more comments, feedback. I want to explain whatever I can for you guys. I know people were also wondering a bit about thyroid disease um, for where it has. And again, I think we that was one of the other things I said I'd bring up for this time. Uh, for going on for tangents, if you guys aren't having questions. Um, you know, the I think for thyroid disease, um, there certainly we, people debate. So if you aren't ovulating from thyroid disease, um, you know, that has a meaningful effect. Um, where there are eggs that are not being released. And certainly when the TSH gets above four, we worry about that. In the 2.5 to four, there's a lot of debate as to how much of an effect there is, but I personally want to have people um, well where the thyroid is regulated. There's a little flexibility. I have started treating more in the three, 3.5. I used to be 2.5 for things, but certainly with hypothyroidism that can affect the IQ, of a developing um, child and so that's something that we certainly want regulated and managed um, for things um, and so um, you know this is uh, something that I think giving treatment for and so especially as blood volume expands over pregnancy you want that addressed I think people can debate you know Armor thyroid versus levothyroxine. Armor thyroid tends to cross the placenta, so some are worried with the use of that. Um, so, um, you know, I would lean a little more away from that. Um, but I think, again, having a little buffer, so if your blood volume expands in pregnancy, you don't become low as the blood volume expands. Um, got one from, coming up here for a question. When doing meds, how often do you have patients come in for ultrasounds to see how they're responding? My goal is usually to do the one ultrasound per month. Sometimes with people with medication resistance where they're anovulatory or oligoovulatory and they don't release eggs, I, sometimes it takes a little more to find their equilibrium, but most after the first cycle, you can find it to, um, to you can bring it um, down to one ultrasound per month. Um, but you want to say when is the best time for sperm and egg to, uh, to find each other, and then you give the trigger shot to determine when things are released. Um, and that, is, and the, I think the goal is not just to say, here's some pills, let's see what happens, but to say, how do you learn from each cycle so that you can tweak the odds and say, what is that best balance of safety and success? Um, Good to see some great people uh, there, and I, I love you all, and thank you for your feedback and everything. Um, let's see, I think that was much of what I've had for things. Well, Sarah, it, and again, get you also in there. Again, I've been monopolizing things here. But anything you would add or you were thinking about as we were going through this all that you would include or address? Not that I can think of. I think you hit it all, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> I've done this once or twice before. I'm passionate about these issues. Um, but at the same time, if you guys um, have questions, write us, you know, give feedback here on the, the post. Um, if you, or, you know, message me or mail us individually, we'll try to, again, if you can come up with a topic we haven't done, we'll make that the next one. I'm planning for the next uh, First Friday Live to be focused on periscope technique, how to reduce um, testing to a single visit to, again, lower uh, the economic cost for things. And uh, we're, uh, we're game for anything that's right for you. Just call us and thank you. 
I wish you all the best of success on all of your fertility journeys, however that plays out, or where, whichever way you approach it, and uh, good luck, and uh, have a wonderful day and weekend, and we're thinking of you. Uh, all the best.